This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Chip in Tampa, Florida, on March the 21st, 2006. Fanny Hill, Memoirs of a Woman of Pleasure, by John Cleland. Part one. Madam, I sit down to give you an undeniable proof of my considering your desires as indispensable orders. Ungracious, then, as this task may be, I shall recall to view those scandalous stages of my life, out of which I emerged at length to the enjoyment of every blessing in the power of love, health, and fortune to bestow whilst yet in the flower of youth, and not too late to employ the leisure afforded me in the great ease and affluence to cultivate an understanding, naturally not a despicable one, and which had, even amidst the whirl of loose pleasures I had been tossed in, exerted more observation on the characters and manners of the world than what is common to those of my unhappy profession, who, while looking on all thought or reflection as their capital enemy, keep it at as great a distance as they can, or destroy it without mercy. Hating, as I mortally do, all unnecessary preface, I shall give you good quarter in this, and use no farther apology than to prepare you for seeing the loose part of my life, wrote with the same liberty that I led it. Truth! Stark, naked truth is the word, and I will not so much as take the pains to bestow the strip of a gauze wrapper on it, but paint situations such as they actually rose to me in nature, careless of violating those laws of decency that were never made for such unreserved intimacies as ours. And you have too much sense, too much knowledge of the originals themselves, to sniff prudishly in and out of character at the pictures of them. The grandest men, those of the first and most leading taste, will not scruple adorning their private closets with nudities, though in compliance with vulgar prejudices they may not think them decent decorations of the staircase or salon. This and enough premise I go south into my personal history. My maiden name was Francis Hill. I was born at a small village near Liverpool in Lancashire, of parents extremely poor, and, I piously believe, extremely honest. My father, who had received maim on his limbs that disabled him from following the more laborious branches of country drudgery, got, by making of nets, a scanty subsistence, which was not much enlarged by my mother's keeping a little day-school for the girls in her neighborhood. They had several children, but none lived to any age except myself, who had received from nature a constitution perfectly healthy. My education, till past fourteen, was no better than very vulgar reading, or rather spelling, an illegible scroll, and a little ordinary plain work composed the whole system of it, and then all my foundation in virtue was no other than a total ignorance of vice, and the shy timidity general to our sex in the tender age of life when objects alarm or frighten more by their novelty than anything else. But then this is a fear too often cured at the expense of innocence, when miss by degrees begins no longer to look on a man as a creature of prey that will eat her. My poor mother had divided her time so entirely between her scholars and her little domestic cares that she spared very little of it to my instruction, having from her own innocence from all ill no hint or thought of guarding me against any. I was now entering on my fifteenth year, when the worst of ills befell me in the loss of my tender, fond parents, who were both carried off by the smallpox within a few days of each other, my father dying first, and thereby hastening the death of my mother, 
so that I was now left an unhappy, friendless orphan, for my father's coming to settle there was accidental, he being originally a Kentishman. That cruel distemper which had proved so fatal to them had indeed seized me, but with such mild and favorable symptoms that I was presently out of danger, and what I then did not know the value of was entirely unmarked. I skip over here an account of the natural grief and affliction which I felt on this melancholy occasion. A little time, and the giddiness of that age dissipated too soon my reflections on that irreparable loss. But nothing contributed more to reconcile me to it than the notions that were immediately put into my head of going to London, and looking out for a service, in which I was promised all assistance and advice from one Esther Davis, a young woman that had been down to see her friends, and who, after the stay of only a few days, was to return to her place. As I had now nobody left alive in the village who had concern enough about what should become of me to start any objections to this scheme, and the woman who took care of me after my parents' death rather encouraged me to pursue it, I soon came to a resolution of making this launch into the wide world by repairing to London in order to seek my fortune, a phrase which, by the by, has ruined more adventurers of both sexes from the country than ever it had made or advanced. Nor did Esther Davis a little comfort and inspirit me to venture with her, by piquing my childish curiosity with the fine sights that were to be seen in London, the tombs, the lions, the king, the royal family, the fine plays and operas, and, in short, all the diversions which fell within her sphere of life, to come at the detail of all which perfectly turned the little head of me. Nor can I remember without laughing the innocent admiration, not without a spice of envy, with which we poor girls, whose church-going clothes did not rise above dowless shifts and stuff-gowns, beheld Esther's scoured satin-gowns, caps bordered with an inch of lace, tawdry ribbons, and shoes belaced with silver, all of which we imagined grew in London, and entered for a great deal into my determination of trying to come in for my share of them. The idea, however, of having the company of a townswoman with her was the trivial, and all the motives that engaged Esther to take charge of me during my journey into town, where she told me, after her manner and style, as how several maids out of the country had made themselves and all their kin forever, that by preserving their virtue some had taken so with their masters, that they had married them, and kept them coaches, and lived vastly grand and happy, and some, mayhap, come to be duchesses. Luck was all, and why not I as well as another? With other almanacs to this purpose, which set me tiptoe to begin this promising journey, and to leave a place which, though my native one contained no relations that I had reason to regret, and was grown insupportable to me, from the change of the tenderest usage into the cold air of charity with which I was entertained even at the only friend's house that I had the least expectation of care and protection from. She was, however, so just to me as to manage the turning into money of the little matters that remained to me after the debts and burial charges were accounted for, and, at my departure, put my whole fortune into my hands, which consisted of a very slender wardrobe, packed up in a very portable box, and eight guineas, with seventeen shillings in silver, stowed up in a spring pouch, which was a greater treasure than ever I had yet seen together, and which I could not conceive there ever was a possibility of running out. And, indeed, I was so entirely taken up with the joy of seeing myself mistress of such an immense sum, that I gave very little attention to a world of good advice which was given me with it. 
Places, then, having been taken for Esther and me on the London wagon, I pass over a very immaterial scene of leave-taking, at which I dropped a few tears between grief and joy, and, for the same reasons of insignificance, skip over all that happened to me on the road, such as the wagoners looking licorice on me, and the schemes laid for me by some of the passengers, which were defeated by the vigilance of my guardian Esther, who, to her justice, took a motherly care of me. At the same time, that she taxed me for her protection by making me bear all travelling charges, which I defrayed with the utmost cheerfulness, and thought myself much obliged to her in the bargain. She took indeed great care that we were not overrated or imposed on, as well as of managing as frugally as possible, expensiveness was not her vice. It was pretty late in a summer evening when we reached London town, in our slow conveyance, though drawn by six at length, as we passed through the greatest streets that led to our inn, the noise of the coaches, the hurry, the crowds of foot-passengers, in short, the new scenery of shops and houses at once pleased and amazed me. But guess at my mortification and surprise when we came to the inn, and our things were landed and delivered to us, when my fellow-traveller and protectress, Esther Davis, who had used me with the utmost tenderness during the journey, and prepared me by no preceding signs for the stunning blow I was to receive when, I say, my only dependence and friend in this strange place, all of a sudden assumed a strange and cool air toward me, as if she dreaded my becoming a burden to her. Indeed, then, of proffering me the continuance of her assistance, and good offices which I relied upon, and never more wanted, she thought herself, it seems, abundantly acquitted of her engagements to me, by having brought me safe to my journey's end, and seeing nothing in her proceedings towards me but what was natural and in order, began to embrace me by way of taking leave, whilst I was so confounded, so struck that I had not spirit or sense enough so much to as mention my hopes or expectations from her experiences and knowledge of the place which she had brought me to. Whilst I stood thus stupid and mute, which she doubtless attributed to nothing more than a concern at parting, this idea procured me perhaps a slight alleviation of it in the following harangue that now we were got safe to London, and she was obliged to go to her place, she advised me by all means to get into one as soon as possible, that I need not fear getting one, that there were more places than parish churches, and she advised me to go to an intelligence office, that if she heard of anything stirring, she would find me and let me know, and that in the meantime I should take a private lodging, and acquaint her where to send to me, that she wished me good luck, and hoped I should always have the grace to keep myself honest, and not bring disgrace on my parentage. With this she took her leave of me, and left me, as it were, on my own hands, full as lightly as I had just been put into hers. Left thus alone, absolutely destitute and friendless, I began then to feel most bitterly the severity of this separation, the scene of which had passed in a little room in the inn, and no sooner was her back turned, but the affliction I felt at my hapless, strange circumstances burst out into a flood of tears which infinitely relieved the oppression of my heart, though I still remained stupefied and most perfectly perplexed how to dispose myself. One of the waiters coming in added yet more to my uncertainty by asking me, in a short way, if I called for anything, to which I replied innocently, No, but I wished him to tell me where I might get a lodging for that night. He said he would go and speak to his mistress, who accordingly came and told me dryly, without entering in the least into the distress she saw me in, that I might have a bed for a shilling, and that she supposed I had some friends in town, here I fetched a deep sigh in vain, I might provide for myself in the morning. 
"'Tis incredible what trifling consolations the human mind will seize in its greatest afflictions. The assurance of nothing more than a bed to lie on for that night calmed my agonies, and, being ashamed to acquaint the mistress of the inn that I had no friends to apply to in town, I proposed to myself to proceed the very next morning to an intelligence office, to which I was furnished with written directions on the back of a ballad Esther had given me. There I counted on getting information of any place that such a country girl as I might be fit for, and where I could get into any sort of being, before my little stock should be consumed. And as to a character, Esther had often repeated to me that I might depend on her managing me one, nor, however affected I was at her leaving me thus, did I entirely cease to rely on her, as I began to think good-naturedly that her procedure was all in course, and that it was only my ignorance of life that had made me take it in the light I had at first. Accordingly, the next morning I dressed myself as clean and neat as my rustic wardrobe would permit me, and, having left my box with special recommendation with the landlady, I ventured out by myself, and, without any more difficulty than can be supposed of a young country girl, barely fifteen, and to whom every sign or shop was a gazing trap, I got to the wished-for intelligence office. It was kept by an elderly woman who sat at the receipt of custom, with a book before her in great form and order, and several scrolls ready-made out of directions for places. I made up then to this important personage, without lifting up my eyes or observing any of the people around me, who were attending there on the same errand as myself, and dropping her curtsies nine deep, just made a shift to stammer out my business to her. Madam, having heard me out, with all the gravity and brow of a petty minister of state, and seeing at one glance over my figure what I was, made me no answer but to ask me the preliminary shilling, on receipt of which she told me places for women were exceedingly scarce, especially as I seemed too slight built for hard work. But she would look over her book, and see what was to be done for me, desiring me to stay a little till she had dispatched some other customers. On this I drew back a little, most heartily mortified at a declaration which carried with it a killing uncertainty that my circumstances could not well endure. Presently, assuming more courage, and seeking some diversion from my uneasy thoughts, I ventured to lift up my head a little, and sent my eyes on a course round the room, wherein they met full tilt with those of a lady, for such my extreme innocence pronounced her, sitting in a corner of the room, dressed in a velvet mantle, notabene in the midst of summer, with her bonnet off, squab fat, red-faced, and at least fifty. She looked as if she would devour me with her eyes, staring at me from head to foot without the least regard to the confusion and blushes her eyeing me so fixedly put me to, and which were to her, no doubt, the strongest commendation and marks of my being fit for her purpose. After a little time, in which my air, person, and whole figure had undergone a strict examination, which I had on my part tried to render favourable to me by primping, drawing up my neck, and setting my best looks, she advanced and spoke to me with the greatest demureness. Sweetheart? Do you want a place? Yes, and please you, with a curtsy down to the ground. Upon this she acquainted me that she was actually come to the office herself to look out for a servant, that she believed I might do, with a little of her instructions, that she could take my very looks for a sufficient character, that London was a very wicked, vile place, that she hoped I would be tractable and keep out of bad company. In short, she said all to me that an old experienced practitioner in town could think of, and which was more than was necessary to take in an artless, inexperienced country maid, 
who was even afraid of becoming a wanderer about the streets, and therefore gladly jumped at the first offer of shelter, especially from so grave and matron-like a lady, for such my flattering fancy assured me this new mistress of mine was, I being actually hired under the nose of the good woman who kept the office, whose shrewd smiles and shrugs I could not help observing, and innocently interpreted them as marks of her being pleased at my getting into place so soon. But, as I afterwards came to know, these bedlams understood one another very well, and this was a market where Mrs. Brown, my mistress, frequently attended, on the watch for any fresh goods that might offer there for the use of her customers and her own profit. Madam was, however, so well pleased with her bargain that, fearing, I presume, lest better advice or some accident might occasion my slipping through her fingers, she would officiously take me in a coach to my inn, where, calling herself for my box, I was, being present, delivered without the least scruple or explanation as to where I was going. This being over, she bid the coachman drive to a shop in St. Paul's churchyard, where she bought a pair of gloves, which she gave me, and thence renewed her directions to the coachman to drive to her house in a street, which accordingly landed us at her door, and after I had been cheered up and entertained, by the way, with the most plausible flams, without one syllable from which I could conclude anything but that I was by the greatest good luck, fallen into the hands of the kindest mistress, not to say friend, that the varsal world could afford, and, accordingly, I entered her doors with the most complete confidence and exultation, promising myself that, as soon as I should get a little settled, I would acquaint Esther Davis with my rare good fortune. You may be sure that the good opinion of my place was not lessened by the appearance of a very handsome back parlour, into which I was led, and which seemed to me magnificently furnished, who had never seen better rooms than the ordinary ones in inns upon the road. There were two gilt pier-glasses and a buffet, on which a few pieces of plates set out to the most shoe dazzled and altogether persuaded me that I must be got into a very reputable family. Here my mistress first began her part, with telling me that I must have good spirits and learn to be free with her, that she had not taken me to be a common servant, to do domestic drudgery, but to be a kind of companion to her, and that if I would be a good girl she would do much more than twenty mothers for me to all of which I answered only by the profoundest and awkwardest curtsies, and a few monosyllables such as, Yes, no, to be sure. Presently my mistress touched the bell, and in came a strapping maid-servant to let us in. Here, Martha, said Mrs. Brown, I've just hired this young woman to look after my linen, so step up and shew her her chamber, and... I charge you use her with as much respect as you would myself, for I have taken a prodigious liking to her, and I do not know what I shall do for her. Martha, who was an arch-jade, and being used to this decoy, had her cue perfect, made me a kind of half-curtsy, and asked me to walk up with her, and accordingly shewed me a neat room, two pairs of stairs backward, in which there was a handsome bed, where Martha told me I was to lie with a young gentlewoman, a cousin of my mistress's, who she was sure would be vastly good to me. Then she ran out into such effected economums of her good mistress, her sweet mistress, and how happy I was to light upon her, that I could not have bespoke a better, with other the like gross stuff such as would itself have started suspicions in any but such an unpractised simpleton, who was now perfectly new to life, and who took every word she said at its very sense that she laid out for me to take it. But she readily saw what a penetration she had to deal with, and measured me very rightly in her manner of whistling to me, so as to make me pleased with my cage, 
and blind to the wires. In the midst of all these false explanations of the nature of my future service, we were rung for down again, and I was reintroduced into the same parlour, where there was a table laid with three covers, and my mistress had now got with her one of her favourite girls, a notable manager of her house, whose business it was to prepare and break such young fillies as I was to the mounting block and she was accordingly in that view allotted me for a bedfellow, and to give her the more authority she had the title of cousin conferred on her by the venerable president of this college. Here I underwent a second survey which ended in the full approbation of Mrs. Phoebe Ayres, the name of my tutress select, to whose care and instructions I was affectionately recommended. Dinner was now set on the table, and, in pursuance of treating me as a companion, Mrs. Brown, with a tone to cut off all dispute, soon overruled my most humble and my most confused protestations against sitting down with her ladyship, which, in my very short breeding, just suggested to me could not be right, or in the order of things. At table the conversation was chiefly kept up by the two madams, and carried on in double-meaning expressions, interrupted every now and then by kind assurance to me, all tending to confirm and fix my satisfaction with my present condition. Augment it they could not, so a very novice was I then. It was here agreed that I should keep myself up and out of sight for a few days, till such clothes could be procured for me as were fit for the character I was to appear in, of my mistress's companion, observing withal that on the first impressions of my figure might depend, and, as they well judged, the prospect of my exchanging my country clothes for London's finery made the clause of confinement digest perfectly well with me. But the truth was, Mrs. Brown did not care that I should be seen or talked to by any, either of her customers, or her does, as they called the girls provided for them, till she had secured a good market for my maidenhead, which I had at least all the appearances of having brought into her ladyship's service. To slip over minutes of no importance to the main of my story, I pass the interval to bedtime in which I was more and more pleased with the views that opened to me of an easy service under these good people, and, after supper, being shooed up to bed, Miss Beebe, who observed a kind of reluctance in me to strip and go to bed in my shift before her, now the maid was withdrawn, came up to me, and, beginning with unpinning my handkerchief and gown, soon encouraged me to go on with undressing myself, and, still blushing at now seeing myself naked to my shift, I hurried to get under the bedclothes out of sight. Phoebe laughed, and was not long before she placed herself by my side. She was about five-and-twenty, by her most suspicious account, in which, according to all appearances, she must have sunk at least ten good years allowance, too, being made for the havoc which a long course of hackney-ship and hot waters must have made of her constitution, and which had already brought her upon the spur, that stale stage, in which those of her profession are reduced to think of showing company instead of seeing it. No sooner than was this precious substitute of my mistress's laid down, but she, who was never out of her way when any occasion of lewdness presented itself, turned to me, embraced, and kissed me with great eagerness. This was new. This was odd. But imputing to it nothing but pure kindness, which, for aught I knew, might be the London way to express in that manner, I was determined not to be behind hand with her, and returned her the kiss and embrace with all the fervour that perfect innocence knew. Encouraged by this, her hands became extremely free, and wandered over my whole body, with touches, squeezes, 
pressures that rather warmed and surprised me with their novelty than they either shocked or alarmed me. The flattering praises she intermingled with these invasions contributed also not a little to bribe my passiveness, and, knowing no ill, I feared none, especially from one who had prevented all doubt of her womanhood by conducting my hands to a pair of breasts that hung loosely down in the size and volume that full sufficiently distinguished her sex, to me at least, who had never made any other comparison. I lay then all tame and passive as she could wish, whilst her freedom raised no other emotions but those of a strange and till then unfelt pleasure. Every part of me was open and exposed to the licentious courses of her hands, which, like a lambent fire, ran over my whole body and thawed all coldness as they went. My breasts, if it is not too bold a figure to call so two hard, firm, rising hillocks, that had just begun to show themselves, or signify anything to the touch, employed and amused her hands a while, till, slipping down lower over a smooth track, she could just feel the soft, silky down that had but a few months before put forth and garnished the Mount Pleasant of those parts, and promised to spread a grateful shelter over the seat of the most exquisite sensation, and which had been, till that instant, the seat of the most insensible innocence. Her fingers played and strove to twine in the young tendrils of that moss, which nature has contrived at once for use and ornament. But, not contented with these outer posts, she now attempts the main spot, and began to twitch, to insinuate, and at length to force an introduction of the finger into the quick itself, in such a manner that, had she not proceeded by insensible gradations that inflamed me beyond the power of modesty to oppose its resistance to their progress, I should have jumped out of my bed and cried for help against such strange assaults. Instead of which, her lascivious touches had lighted up a new fire that wantoned through all my veins, but fixed with violence in that centre appointed them by nature, where the first strange hands were now busied in feeling, squeezing, compressing the lips, then opening them again with a finger in between, till an oh expressed her, hurting me, where the narrowness of the unbroken passage refused it entrance to any depth. In the meantime, the extension of my limbs, languid stretchings, sighs, short heavings, all conspired to assure that experienced wanton that I was more pleased than offended at her proceedings, which she seasoned with repeated kisses and exclamations such as, Oh, what a charming creature thou art! What a happy man will be that first that makes a woman of you! Oh, that I were a man for your sake! With the like broken expressions interrupted by kisses as fierce and fervent as ever I received from the other sex. For my part I was transported, confused, and out of myself. Feelings so new were too much for me. My heated and alarmed senses were in a tumult that robbed me of all liberty of thought. Tears of pleasure gushed from my eyes, and somewhat assuaged the fire that raged all over me. Phoebe herself, the hackneyed, thoroughbred Phoebe, to whom all modes and devices of pleasure were known and familiar, found, it seems, in this exercise of her art to break young girls, the gratification of one of those arbitrary tastes for which there is no accounting. Not that she hated men, or did not even prefer them to her own sex, but when she met with such occasions as this was, 
a satiety of enjoyments in the common road, perhaps to a secret bias, inclined her to make the most of pleasure wherever she could find it, without distinction of sexes. In this view, now well assured that she had by her touches sufficiently inflamed me for her purpose, she rolled down the bedclothes gently, and I saw myself stretched, naked, my shift being turned up to my neck, whilst I had no power or sense to oppose it. Even my glowing blushes expressed more desire than modesty, whilst the candle left, to be sure not undesignedly, burning, threw a full light on my whole body. No, says Phoebe, you must not, my sweet girl, think to hide all these treasures from me. My sight must be feasted as well as my touch. I must devour with my eyes this springing bosom. Suffer me to kiss it. I have not seen it enough. Let me kiss it once more. What what firm, smooth, white flesh is here! How delicately shaped! Then this delicious down! Oh, let me view the small, dear, tender cleft! Oh, this is too much! I cannot bear it! I must! I must! Here she took my hand, and, in a transport, carried it where you will easily guess, but... What a difference in the state of the same thing! A spreading thicket of bushy curls marked the full-grown complete woman. Then the cavity to which she guided my hand easily received it, and as soon as she felt it within her, she moved herself to and fro with so rapid a friction that I presently withdrew it wet and clammy when instantly Phoebe grew more composed. After two or three sighs, the heart fetched hoo-hoos, and giving me a kiss that seemed to exhale her soul through her lips, she replaced the bedclothes over us. What pleasure she had found I will not say, but this I know, that the first sparks of kindling nature the first ideas of pollution were caught by me that night, and that the acquaintance and communication with the bad of our sex is often as fatal to innocence as all the seductions of the other. But to go on, when Phoebe was restored to that calm which I was far from the enjoyment of myself, she artfully sounded me on all the points necessary to govern the designs of my virtuous mistress on me, and by my answers draw from pure, undissembled nature, she had no reason but to promise herself all imaginable success, so far as it depended on my ignorance, easiness, and warmth of constitution. After a sufficient length of dialogue, my bedfellow left me to my rest, and I fell asleep, through pure weariness from the violent emotions I had been led into, when nature, which had been too warmly stirred and fermented to subside without allaying by some means or the other, relieved me by one of those luscious dreams, the transports of which are scarce inferior to those of waking real action. We breakfasted, and the tea-things were scarce removed, when in were brought two bundles of linen, and wearing apparel, in short all the necessaries, for rigging me out, as they termed it, completely. In the morning I woke about ten, perfectly gay and refreshed. Phoebe was up before me, and asked me in the kindest manner how I did how I rested, and if I was ready for breakfast, carefully at the same time avoiding to increase the confusion she saw I was in, and looking her in the face by any hint of the night's bed scene. I told her, if she pleased, I would get up, and begin any work she would be pleased to set me about. She smiled. 
Presently the maid brought in the tea equipage, and I had just huddled my clothes on when in waddled my mistress. I expected no less than to be told of, if not chid for, my late rising, when I was agreeably disappointed by her compliments on my pure and fresh looks. I was a bud of beauty, this was her style, and how vastly all the fine men would admire me. To all which my answer did not, I can assure you, wrong my breeding. They were as simple and silly as you could wish, and no doubt flattered them infinitely more than had they proved me enlightened by education and a knowledge of the world. Imagine to yourself, madam, how my little coquette heart fluttered with joy at the sight of a white lute-string, flowered with silver, scoured indeed, but passed on me for spick and span new, a Brussels lace cap, braided shoes, and the rest in proportion, all second-hand finery, and procured instantly for the occasion by the diligence and industry of the good Mrs. Brown, who had already a chapman for me in the house, before whom my charms were to pass in review, for he had not only, in course, insisted on a previous sight of the premises, but also on immediate surrender to him, in case of this agreeing for me, concluding very wisely that in such a place as I was one of the hottest to trust the keeping of such a perishable commodity in as a maidenhead. The care of dressing and tricking me out for the market was then left to Phoebe, who acquitted herself, if not well, at least perfectly to the satisfaction of everything but my impatience of seeing myself dressed. When it was over, and I viewed myself in the glass, I was, no doubt, too natural, too artless, to hide my childish joy at the change, a change in the real truth for much the worse, since I must have much better become the neat, easy simplicity of my rustic dress than the awkward, untoward, tawdry finery that I could not conceal my strangeness to. Phoebe's compliments, however, in which her own share in dressing me was not forgot, did not a little confirm in me the first notions I had ever entertained concerning my person, which, be it said without vanity, was then tolerable to justify a taste for me, and of which it may not be out of place here to sketch you an unflattered picture. I was tall, yet not too tall for my age, which, as I before remarked, was barely turned of fifteen. My shape perfectly straight, thin-waisted and light and free, without owing anything to stays. My hair was a glossy auburn and soft as silk, flowing down my neck in natural buckles, and did not a little set off the whiteness of my smooth skin. My face was rather too ruddy, though its features were delicate, and the shape a roundish oval, except where a pit on my chin had a far from disagreeable effect. My eyes were as black as can be imagined, and rather languishing than sparkling, except on certain occasions when I have been told they struck fire fast enough. My teeth, which I ever carefully preserved, were small, even, and white. My bosom was finely raised, and one might then discern rather the promise than the actual growth of the round, firm breasts that in a little time made that promise good. In short, all the points of beauty that were most universally in request, I had, or at least my vanity forbade me to appeal from the decision of our sovereign judges the men, who all that I ever knew at least gave it thus highly in my favor, and I met with, even in my own sex, some that were above denying me that justice, while others praised me yet more unsuspectedly by endeavoring to detract from me in points of person and figure that I obviously excelled in. This is, I own, too strong of self-praise, but 
Should I not be ungrateful to nature, and to form to which I owe such singular blessings of pleasure and fortune, were I to suppress, through affectation and modesty, the mention of such valuable gifts? Well, then, dressed I was, and little did then enter into my head that all this gay attire was no more than decking the victim out for sacrifice, whilst I innocently attributed all to mere friendship and kindness in the sweet and good Mrs. Brown, who, I was forgetting to mention, had, under pretense of keeping my money safe, got from me, without the least hesitation, the driblet, so I now call it, which remained to me after the expenses of my journey. After some little time, most agreeably spent before the glass, in scarce self-admiration, since my new dress had by much the greater share in it, I was sent for down to the parlour, where the old lady saluted me, and wished me joy in my new clothes, which, she was not ashamed to say, fitted me as if I had worn nothing but the finest all my lifetime. But what was it that she could not see me silly enough to swallow? At the same time she presented me to another cousin of her own creation, an elderly gentleman who got up at my entry to the room, and, on my dropping a curtsy to him, saluted me, and seemed a little affronted that I had only presented my cheek to him, a mistake which, if one, he immediately corrected by gluing his lips to mine with an ardour which his figure had not at all disposed me to thank him for. His figure, I say, than which nothing could be more shocking or detestable, for ugly and disagreeable were terms too gentle to convey a just idea of it. Imagine yourself a man rather past three score, short and ill-made, with a yellow, cadaverous hue, great goggling eyes that stared as if he were strangled, and outmouth from two more properly tusks than teeth, livid lips, and breath like a jake's, that he had a peculiar ghastliness in his grin that made him perfectly frightful, if not dangerous to women with child, yet made as he was, in mock of man, he was so blind to his own staring deformities as to think himself born for pleasing, and that no woman could see him with impunity, in consequence of which idea he had lavished great sums on such wretches as could gain upon themselves to pretend love to this person, whilst to those who had not art or patience to dissemble the horror it inspired, he behaved even brutally. Impotence, more than necessity, made him seek in variety the provocative that was wanting to raise him to the pitch of enjoyment, which, too, he often saw him self-balked of by the failure of his powers, and this always threw him into a fit of rage, which he wreaked as far as he durst on the innocent objects of his fit of momentary desire. This, then, was the monster to whom my conscientious benefactress, who had long been his purveyor in this way, had doomed me, and sent for me down proposedly for his examination. Accordingly, he made me stand up before him, turned me around, unpinned my handkerchief, remarked to him the rise and fall, the turn and whiteness of a bosom just beginning to fill, then made me walk, and took even a handle from the rusticity of my gait, to inflame the inventory of my charms. In short, she omitted no point of jockeyship to which he only answered by gracious nods of approbation, whilst he looked goats and monkeys at me, for I sometimes stole a corner glance at him, and, encountering his fiery, eager stare, looked another way from pure horror and affright, which he, doubtless in character, attributed to nothing more than maiden modesty, or at least the affectation of it. However, I was soon dismissed, and reconducted to my room by Phoebe, 
who struck close to me, not leaving me alone and at leisure to make such reflections as might naturally arise in any one, not an idiot, on such a scene as I had just gone through. But, to my shame, be it confessed, such was my invincible stupidity, or rather portentous innocence, that I did not yet open my eyes to Mrs. Brown's designs, and saw nothing in this titular cousin of hers, but a shocking, hideous person, which did not at all concern me, unless that my respect to all her cousinhood. Phoebe, however, began to sift the state and pulses of my heart towards this monster, asking me how I should approve of such a fine gentleman for a husband. Fine gentleman? I suppose she called him from his being daubed with lace. I answered her very naturally that I had no thoughts of a husband, but that if I was to choose one, it should be among my own degree, sure. So much had my aversion to that wretch's hideous figure indisposed me to all fine gentlemen, and confounded my ideas as if those of that rank had been necessarily cast in the same mould that he was. But Phoebe was not to be beat off so, but went on with her endeavours to melt and soften me for the purposes of my reception into that hospitable house, and whilst she talked of the sex in general, she had no reason to despair of a compliance, which more than one reason shewed her would be easily enough obtained of me. But then she had too much experience not to discover that my particular fixed aversion to that frightful cousin would be a block not so readily removed, as suited the consummation of their bargain and sale of me. Mother Brown had in the meantime agreed the terms with this licorice old goat, which afterwards understood were to be fifty guineas, peremptory for the liberty of attempting me, and a hundred more at the complete gratification of his desires, in the triumph over my virginity. And as for me, I was to be left entirely at the discretion of his liking and generosity." This unrighteous contract being thus settled, he was so eager to be put in possession that he insisted upon being introduced to drink tea with me that afternoon, when we were to be left alone, nor would he hearken to the procuress's remonstrances that I was not sufficiently prepared and ripened for such an attack, that I was too green and untamed, having been scarce twenty-four hours within the house. It is the character of lust to be impatient, and his vanity arming him against any supposition of other than the common resistance of a maid on those occasions, made him reject all proposals of a delay, and my dreadful trial was thus fixed, unknown to me, for that very evening. At dinner Mrs. Brown and Phoebe did nothing but run riot in praises of this wonderful cousin, and how happy that woman would be that he would favour with his addresses. In short, my two gossips exhausted all their rhetoric to persuade me to accept them, that the gentleman was violently smitten with me at first sight, that he would make my fortune if I would be a good girl and not stand in my own light that I should trust his honour, that I should be made for ever and have a chariot to go abroad in, with all such stuff as was fit to turn the head of such a silly ignorant girl as I then was, but likely here my aversion had taken already such deep root in me, my heart was so strongly defended from him by my senses, that wanting the art to mask my sentiments, I gave them no hope of their employers succeeding, at least very easily, with me. The glass, too, marched pretty quick, with a view, I suppose, to make a friend of the warmth of my constitution in the minutes of the imminent attack. Thus they kept me pretty long at table, and about six in the evening, after I was retired to my own apartment and the tea-board was set, enters my venerable mistress, 
followed close by that satyr, who came in grinning in a way peculiar to him, and by his odious presence confirmed me in all the sentiments of detestation which his first appearance had given birth to. He sat down, fronting me, and all tea-time kept ogling me in a manner that gave me the utmost pain and confusion, all the marks of which he still explained to be my bashfulness, and not being used to see company. Tea over, the commoting old lady pleaded urgent business, which indeed was true, to go out, and earnestly desired me to entertain her cousin kindly till she came back, both for my own sake and hers, and then with a, Pray, sir, be very good, be very tender of the sweet child, she went out of the room, leaving me staring with my mouth open and unprepared by the suddenness of her departure to oppose it. We were now alone. And on that idea a sudden fit of trembling seized me. I was so afraid, without a precise notion of why and what I had to fear, that I sat on the settee by the fireside motionless and petrified, without life or spirit, not knowing how to look or how to stir. But long I was not suffered to remain in this state of stupefaction. The monster squatted down by me on the settee, and without farther ceremony or preamble, flings his arms about my neck, and drawing me pretty forcibly toward him, obliged me to receive, in spite of my struggles to disengage from him, his pestilential kisses, which quite overcame me. Finding me, then, next to senseless and unresisting, he tears off my neck-handkerchief, and laid all open there to his eyes and hands. Still I endured all without flinching, till, emboldened by my sufferance and silence, for I had not the power to speak or to cry out, he attempted to lay me down on the settee, and I felt his hand on the lower part of my naked thighs, which were crossed, and which he endeavored to unlock. Oh! Then I was roused out of my passive endurance, and, springing from him with an activity he was not prepared for, threw myself at his feet, and begged him in the most moving tone not to be rude, and that he would not hurt me. "'Hurt you, my dear,' said the brute. "'I intend no harm.' Has not the old lady told you that I love you? Then I shall do handsomely by you. She has indeed, sir, said I. But I cannot love you, indeed I cannot. Pray let me alone, yes. I will love you dearly if you will let me alone and go away. But I was talking to the wind, for whether my tears, my attitude, or the disorder of my dress provided French incentives, or whether he was not under the dominion of desires he could not bridle, but snorting and foaming with lust and rage, he renews his attack, seizes me, and again attempts to extend and fix me on the settee, in which he succeeded so far as to lay me along, and even to toss my petticoats over my head, and lay my thighs bare, which I obstinately kept closed, nor could he, though he attempted with his knee to force them open, effect it, so far as to stand fair for being master of the main avenue. He was unbuttoned, both waistcoat and breeches, yet I only felt the weight of his body upon me, whilst I lay struggling with indignation and dying with terror, but he stopped all of a sudden, and got off, panting, blowing, cursing, and repeating, old and ugly, for so I had very naturally called him in the heat of my defence. The brute had, it seems, as I afterwards understood, brought on by his eagerness and struggle the ultimate period of his hot fit of lust, which his power was too short-lived to carry him through the full execution of, of which my thighs and linen received the effusion. When it was over, he bid me, with a tone of displeasure, get up, saying that, 
he would not do me the honor to think of me any more, that the old bitch might look out for another cully, that he would not be fooled by air a country mock modesty in England, that he supposed I'd left my maidenhead with some hobnail in the country, and was come to dispose of my skin milk in town, with a volley of the like abuse, which I listened to with more pleasure than ever fond woman did to protestations of love from her darling minion, for, incapable as I was of receiving any addition to my perfect hatred and aversion to him, I looked on this railing as my security against his renewing his most odious caresses. Yet, plain as Mrs. Brown's views were now come out, I had not the heart or spirit to open my eyes to them. Still I could not part with my dependence on that bedlam, so much did I think myself hers, soul and body, or rather I sought to deceive myself with the continuation of my good opinion of her, and chose to wait the worst at her hands sooner than be turned out to starve in the streets without a penny of money or a friend to apply to. These fears were my folly. Whilst this confusion of ideas was passing in my head, I sat pensive by the fire, with my eyes brimming with tears, my neck still bare, and my cap fallen off in the struggle, so that my hair was in the disorder you may guess the villain's lust began, I suppose, to be again in flow at the sight of all that bloom of youth which presented itself to his view, a bloom yet unenjoyed, and, of course, not yet indifferent to him. After some pause he asked me, in a tone of voice mightily softened, whether I would make it up with him before the old lady returned, and all should be well. He would restore me his affections, at the same time offering to kiss me and feel my breasts. But now my extreme aversion, my fears, my indignation, all acting upon me, gave me a spirit not natural to me, so that, breaking loose from him, I ran to the bell and rang it before he was aware, with such violence and effect, that it brought up the maid to know what was the matter, or whether the gentleman wanted anything and before he could proceed to other extremities she bounced into the room, and, seeing me stretched on the floor, my hair all dishevelled, my nose gushing out blood, which did not a little tragedize the scene, and my odious persecutor still intent of pushing his brutal point, unmoved by all my cries and distresses, she was herself confounded, and did not know what to say. As much, however, as Martha might be prepared and hardened to transactions of this sort, all womanhood must have been out of her heart, could she have seen this unmoved. Besides that, on the face of things, she imagined that matters had gone greater lengths than they really had, and that the courtesy of the house had been actually consummated on me, and flung me into this condition that I was in, in the notion she instantly took part, and advised the gentleman to go down and leave me to recover myself, and that all would be soon over with me, and when Mrs. Brown and Phoebe, who were gone out, were returned, they would take order for everything to his satisfaction, and that nothing would be lost by a little patience with the poor tender thing, and that for her part she was frightened, she could not tell what to say to such doings, but that she would stay by me till my mistress came home. As the wench said all this in a resolute tone, and the monster himself began to perceive that things would not mend by his staying, he took his hat and went out of the room, murmuring and pleating his brows like an old ape, so that I was delivered from the horrors of his detestable presence. As soon as he was gone, Martha very tenderly offered me her assistance in anything, and would have got me some heartshorn drops and put me to bed, which at last I first positively refused, in fear that the monster might return and take me at that advantage, 
however, with much persuasion and assurances that I should not be molested that night, she prevailed on me to lie down, and, indeed, I was so weakened by my struggles, so dejected by my fearful apprehensions, so terror-struck, that I had not power to sit up, or hardly to give answers to the questions with which the curious Martha plied and perplexed me. Such, too, and so cruel was my fate that I dreaded the sight of Mrs. Brown as if I had been the criminal and she the person injured, a mistake which you will not think so strange on distinguishing that neither virtues nor principle had the least share in the defense I had made, but only the particular aversion I had conceived against the first brutal and frightful invader of my tender innocence. I passed then the time till Mrs. Brown's return home, under all the agitations of fear and despair that may easily be guessed. So ends Part One.